Leeds United made the most of their second chance in the European Cup against Stuttgart, the team they say has more foreign reserves than the Bank of England. Leeds won 2-1 in Barcelona in front of a tiny crowd. Their hero was Karl Schutt. He scored the winner less than a minute after coming on as a substitute, and tomorrow's his birthday. Welcome back to another episode of the Talking Shop podcast, episode 119. Uh, I'm joined tonight by the man that is uh, Raggy, sporting his beard. Beard's coming back, pal. We had a bit of a clean shave over the week, but it's, it's getting there now. Yeah, yeah. Lockdown two, isn't it? So, uh, lockdown, lockdown the sequel. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I'm joined by uh, Young Ben, who's back this week after missing last week. Uh, he's back in Harry Potter studio, but what is blatantly obvious, Ben, is Where's the where's the Olympic bar and, and where it's gone? Have we have we get it up or no? I had him I had him down in my bedroom this uh, well today while I'm watching uh, US election pumping some iron watching Biden make build some ground. It's been a good day, really. Yeah, give so, yeah. you give him up for jumble sale, aren't you? Someone's been coming around. <laughs> yeah. like, he's got no prop top and wear money. Exactly. Why are you using him? <laughs> so, loads of stuff to get through uh, in this show. Obviously, cover the defeat to Leicester, uh, various other League United news. And we will be joined shortly when he um, manages to break out of London rush hour traffic by former League United midfielder uh, Simon Walton. So, it'll be, it'll be really interesting to get his take on things, uh, both uh, League United currently, but his time at Leeds as well, because we were just discussing off air how he broke through it. Um, Probably a little bit of an unfortunate time for him. The club were clinging on by grim depth to try and get back to the Premier League and it didn't work out. And I think uh, Simon were made as, a again, another cash injection from a certain uh, Kenneth Bates. Um, so, yeah, we'll get, we'll get into him when he does uh, come back in a bit later on in the show. Um, obviously, we are currently live um, on YouTube and Facebook. If you're watching live, just do us a favour, just share the stream, pass it around. If you're in any League United groups or all that, please do the same with that. Get your comments in. Um, I will endeavour to get through some comments this week. I didn't get through many last week, um, as we obviously had the man that is Fenners on uh, Soccer AM, and he, uh, he had some good some good chat, so we didn't really get time for any questions. But yeah, so lads, best place to start, or not really best place to start, is the game uh, the other night in a rain-soaked, quite deluged uh, Ellen Road. Um, does the 4 1 scoreline before we get into the game slightly flatter Leicester? And I don't want to take anything away from how well they played, actually, but does it flatter them a bit? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it flattered them, um, but it were definitely it were a hectic first opening 30 minutes, I thought. And if Bamford puts that edge away, it'd be a completely different story. Um, there were a few mix ups, and I think it was just the this well, the this the defense seemed terrorized by Vardy. And it almost feels like we just didn't settle into the game. And, you know, the, the surface didn't look great. The ball kept holding up, which don't, which don't bode well for us and the, the attacking football that, that we play. But it were, it were a very strange opening, opening half, actually. It wasn't something that, that, we're quite, that we're quite used to. It took us a while to, to grow into the game. Um, but, yeah, saying that, I, I don't... Leicester definitely deserved the win. And they definitely deserved the goals that they scored as well. Um, we'll get onto the penalty shout later on because I'm I have an opinion on that. But you know, apart from that, I, I thought they were great. I thought they, they nullified us really well. Yeah, I mean, Rags, not to provide excuses for the Leeds players, because I think um Stuart Dallas came out after the game and basically said after 30 minutes we've just given ourselves an uphill battle to to get back into the game. And I, I agree with him, but how much um how much of an impact do you think the state of the pitch were? Because the first goal that Vardy scores after Bamford's guilted chance at the other end, uh, Cox, to me, looks like he, he looks very much worried about losing his footing. He's gone to that little step thing that you do when you realise you're going to deck it or lose your feet. Um, you know, again, I'm not taking, ex I'm not making excuses for him as a Germany international. He shouldn't be making them mistakes, really. But you know, how much of a, an impact did that rain have? Do you think on the game? 
Yeah, well, like you say, individual errors cost us, um, but there were like there were loads of them. That was the thing. It wasn't just the goals that that they scored. Um, you know, you, uh, uh, Melies pulled off two two other good saves to keep us in it. They've, they've missed a couple as well. You know, I mean, we were the masters of our own demise. The the, the first thirty, maybe thirty five minutes of that first half, um, we looked we looked really poor. Like you say, we looked we looked. Dead scared of their their front front pairing, um, um, or, or almost like a front three really, um, and and they punished us, and and it's going to happen at this at this level. But also then, like you say, once we tried to get hold of the ball, which Sky made a lot of how good Leicester were, and yeah, like you say, don't take anything away from them, and they, and they punished our mistakes. But we just were constantly giving them the ball. It wasn't like they were working hard to get it back. It, we were just giving it a ball. And and you you look at the game moving into the second half and how vastly different it was. And it just goes to show that they were, you know, it wasn't the fact that kind of Leicester just dominated us. It was just the fact that we just didn't do what we would normally do in that first half. And we and as it, as it went on, the last ten minutes were. Uh, progressive, and we we looked like we could we could actually do something. We sh- should have perhaps taken one of those chances, um, and it was just all set up like that. You, you know, you're two 0 down at home, and you'll never ever write a Marcelo Bielsa team off because we've seen ridiculous comebacks from from this team, and you can't do that. Um, but you've given you've given yourself all everything to do, and then you look at the two goals that, uh, that we concede in the second half. And especially the third one. I mean, that is just typical. Was that the only chance that they'd had? That's that second half. I think yeah, it is. Isn't it? Yeah. You know, we've done uh, so well to get back in that game. We score early doors. Everything that you want perfectly for it, and then dominate, 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 and we just can't can't put it in. And then they just hit us on the counter attack. And that that third goal just kind of amplified, you know, the options that they had on the bench as well. They had James Madison, who for me is a, a an England starter when he's full firing. Um, and the lad, uh, the lad, the Turkish lad from, uh, from on loan from Roma, you know the the on caliber of player that they they could bring, they could bring on and, and help affect the game. You know is 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 completely different to us. Uh, obviously with with Rafinha and, and Rodrigo being out, um, yeah. but yeah, I think it was just a, a lack of depth on the day maybe as well. I'll also show my ass on town hall steps if under meant to pass it to Jamie Vardy for their third. He yeah. definitely tried to lift it over Melier. I'm not having that for, yeah, I agree. for one second. So, yeah. But uh, going back, I think, you know, to, to take some positives out, we did create stuff. Um, and just before they score the third, Pablo rattles the angle, if you like, with a with a very Pablo-esque, you know, good bit of tight feet and then curls it and leaves Schmeichel completely stranded. So, you know, although, although Stra- uh, Schmeichel's not pulling him out at top bin all over, we did create enough chances to at least do something, obviously. Again, you know, P- P- Paddy, I saw the usual the usuals on, on Twitter jumping all over Bamford, you know, post him scoring a hat-trick. And, yeah, you know, he should do a bit better with a header for definite. And is, the second chance I can really think about is that, that first touch where Schmeichel comes out and smothers it. Um, but you know, it just it just had a feel that it was going to be one of them nights for him. Um, I thought you know we we struggled to get in the game in the first 30, 35 minutes, and I think for the first time we saw this year where we weren't quite at it and the team punished us. Whereas yeah. even, you know even Liverpool we, we were we were at it again. It was kind of individual errors and penalties and stuff like that. But I think for the first time we saw a substandard Leeds and a team that that basically play the way they play, which is soak up the pressure. And I, I think that Leicester are the best counter, counter-attacking counter side in uh, in the Premier League by a country mile. We have Harvey Barnes and, and Jamie Vardy, absolutely yeah. frightening pace-wise. And, you know, and I've got to give credit to Brendan Rodgers, you know, despite what people think of him. He, he basically said how they were going to play beforehand and I, I think he, he worked it to a to a T. And a few people said, oh, he tactically outclassed Bielsa. My, my opinion on that is that it's difficult to tactically outclass Rodgers when your team are not playing as well as they can play. You know what I mean? You kind of need your team to buy into the tactics. And we couldn't buy into it because we couldn't make simple passes. We were all over place when, when ball went to back. You know, probably credit to Leicester, to be honest, for, for making us um, making us as life hell. But after that, you know, to, to give some positives, we, we started coming into the game towards the end of the first half. And I... I I got. I kind of got the feeling if we'd have scored at end of first half, it might have been a different start to second half. Obviously, we did score 
quite quickly into the second half with Dallas's whipped ball that, you know, it's one of them where keeper expects to get somebody to get something on it, done and it and it nestles in corner. And it felt like game on then. And we were, we were again we were back in the game, but I don't think Leicester ever really looked looked flat. I don't think ever really looked, you know, looked under pressure, to be honest. Obviously, Pablo's great chance and a couple of through balls to to Pat Bamford, but they were pretty comfortable, I thought. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I, I was struggling to work out exactly what we... Obviously, the, the substitution at half-time, um, Shackleton hadn't, hadn't been able to impose himself on the game the way that he had at Villa. Um, you bring Pervada on and then you kind of like, well, we've got... How many wingers on? <laughs> we've got We've got like four wingers, if you can include Pablo in that. Um, and they were just kind of quite fluid and they, they moved it around um, in positions and they were all kind of swapping and changing, which... I think helped us, um, but I don't know. Like you say, it just it would have been without without creating huge amounts of guilt or chances. Yeah, I agree with you there. And at that point, obviously, it's kind of less as prerogative to think. Well, actually, we're, we're pretty solid at the back, and we'll, we'll be all right. And uh, mm. invariably, they will. Like you say, we're, we're a couple of inches away with Pablo's effort of of, of making it two two. And then it's you know it's it's back to anyone's game. Then they they might come back and attack it, but it's just one of them, isn't it? Before yeah. before we get on to the inevitable VAR conversation about the the fourth goal, which to be honest, as soon as he spent ages looking, well not ages looking at the monitor, as soon as he went over to look at the monitor, I thought he's going to give this. Um, and yeah. uh, I, I've got a feeling that Martin Tyler and Alan Smith had got uh, got his ear as well because they would not shut or, shut up about the fact that it was a penalty. What this that and the other. But before um, before we kind of get into that, obviously we saw. Pablo get took off and looked quite disappointed and pretty angry. And, you know, I thought he was just beginning to get into his stride a little bit. He was just beginning to play them balls we know he can play. We're just beginning to drop deep and, and uh, get onto the ball. But, you know, Marcelo came out in his post-match and said, well, I can't help it if Pablo wants to kick a, kick a water bottle back when, when I've substituted him. Do you, what, what's your thoughts? Do you think um, think Marcelo will have a word with him or do you think he'll let it fly as... as it's frustration. I think my, my thoughts on it are that we've we've seen Rodrigo start in that in that position and excel. Really start to show us why he will, you know, costing us twenty seven million pound. Um, and he almost has the big shoes to fill again. And it, and it it was more of an opportunity to kind of grasp. And I thought it was very poor in the first half. I won't lie. I thought it was pretty sloppy. Um, and it started to. I think the frustration comes because he he may have felt that. He was starting to really get into the game and 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 you know in feel comfortable in the tempo of the game and just as he's doing that he's dragged off. Um, I do like to see players frustrated to come off because he clearly mm -hmm. thinks he can make a difference. You know, mm -hmm. and it, no fault of his own, but I'd, it, as much as you like to see it, you know, you don't want to upset the balance. And I'm sure that there's a perfectly good reason why he was brought off. Yeah, like I say, I, I don't mind. I don't mind players having a you know. Having a chelp and, and and being gutted that the brick coming off that that's no problem as long as he doesn't let that. We talked about Stewart last week and you know don't, not letting being hooked at, on twenty minutes affect him. It's the same with Pablo. You know I know he's a seasoned pro and everything like that and one of our experienced players. You can't let that like cloud the rest of you know going into the next game or anything like that. Um, but you know you can be upset personally, um, but at the end of the day, it's manager's decision. Yeah. Yeah, I have to agree with that. And the thing is, as well, we've one thing we've learned um, over over the time we've had Marcelo is you can't predict what he's going to do. I think we were having a, a bit of a debate in the WhatsApp group about I'd swap this for this. I mean, I think me and Paddy were of the belief that I'd have probably took uh, Shackleton off and put Stroik on and sit Stroik in um, holding midfielder and push push uh, click a bit further forward. But you know what? Um, as we've heard many many more times and learned many times before. You know, Marcelo will do what he want, and eight times out of ten, nine times out of ten, he gets it right, even when we don't see it. You know, like yeah. um, like like the game against uh, Villa, for example, when he when he hooked Stroke and brought Shackleton on, none of us saw that coming, um, and he stuck clicking Calvin's role, and you know we took over the game and, and ultimately put him to the sword. So you know what, um, I think Pablo is, is long enough in the tooth. He's been around top top teams before, and you know he'll know, and I, I'm pretty sure that. Marcelo will know that he don't need to. He don't need to have a word with him. But one thing that did stick out for me, not particularly in the first half, but in the second half, was uh, missing Rodrigo. 
I, I really felt like we missed him. Obviously, yeah. on the evening of the game, um, he was self-isolating because he'd been around um, some dude tested positive for COVID. And then he subsequently tested positive for COVID himself, which he announced on his Instagram last night, which means he has to self-isolate for 10 days. Um, so in a weird kind of way, because he's tested positive, it works out a little bit better for us because we get four days less. of the. To be honest, lads, I'm really struggling to, to understand when and how long you stay off for. That's an all different podcast in itself. Yeah, I think, this, yeah. yeah, this is a different story for a different time. But yeah. So yeah, so I, I genuinely thought we missed him. And I thought that we probably missed that bit of impact off Rafinha as well because I think he could have stretched the game a little bit um, yeah. at times. But do you know what? Leicester did a slightly better job on us than Wolves, I felt. They were, they were quite similar, but Leicester were just better on account of them than what Wolves were. I were, I were really impressed with uh, Justin, uh, you know, he's a, he's a full-back coming in at centre-half and for Fanner as well, you can understand why they spent the kind of money on him. Uh, they look so comfortable at, at the back. And, you know, let's not, let's not forget, you know, this is this is a team who finished, I mean, they didn't finish stronger last season, but they finished in the co- kind of top half of, of the Premier League couple of, for a couple of seasons. Um and they beat, they've already beat City 5-2 this year. And, I mean, you could argue that Jamie Vardy is England's best striker at the moment. It's, you know, it's nothing to be disheartened about. It's it's a result that hasn't gone our way. And, you know, we, we, we bounce back against Palace. That's how I see it. Uh, obviously, it's disheartening. But when you look at the players that are playing for Leicester and where they've come and, you know, who they're coached by, you know, this is, it's it's not really all doom and gloom, really. No, you, absolutely. You, you, look at the, you look at the start of that game and you look at, obviously, conceding after... In the second minute, they they get one another early goal. You're two nil down. You know, I would be dis I would be disappointed if we hadn't got ourselves back in the game, but we did. You know what I mean? Obviously, we haven't got the the result at the end, but for big parts of that second half, it very much looked like you know if we get a chance here and we take it, then we 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 back level, and then it's anyone's game. You know, the, it wasn't out of the realms of possibility that we could have won that game. You know what I mean? And that's why that, that's what you've got to take from it. The fact that we got ourselves back in that game is is the things you've got to focus on. And then, you know, we've, we've, there's plenty of other teams out there that are a lot worse than Leicester that we will, that we need to take the, the points over. So, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've just got a text off Simon. He's um, he's managed to snaggle his way through uh, London traffic. Uh, so he'll be joining us shortly. And I'll be um, I'll be interested to get his thoughts on what he saw the game as a, obviously, as a, a top player. Um before we uh, move on to that, though, I had a bit of a mm, running, shall we say. I attracted some Leicester friends after the game. I felt like I'd, I felt like I'd pulled, if I'm honest, lads. Um, I, I wondered if I could get a taxi down to Leicester because you know they were, they were my big mates. But they seem they was of the belief that, they was of the belief that they dominated the game. Now I know it's a play on words, but my opinion of dominated appears to be a lot different to them because despite a four-one defeat, we still had sixty-three, I think, sixty-three percent possession and not as. You know, near enough as many um, as many shots, not on target as them, but as many shots as them. Um, so you know, um, dominated. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, would, I wouldn't say dominate. Like I say, I think I think first half we were the, the masters of our own demise. We were, really did. Um, we squandered possession a lot, uh, and we gave it away in poor areas, and they capitalised on it. Um, you know, possession isn't everything, and we've seen a lot of teams who do have a lot of possession without doing anything with it. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not that sort of football team. So when we do get 60% possession, usually we, we do a lot of attacking with that. So, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they dominated us all. No. no they, they just they, they took advantage of us. on a, They took advantage of a bad day at office. And, yeah. and it's just... Yeah, and there's no, no doubt about it. And they play, that, they play that game well. They play the counter-attacking yeah. game well. And, 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 you know, they probably don't go out to, to win... 60% possession all the time and that, that's not the way they play. That That's fine. But yeah, dominating it is not probably the words I'd use. And for those uh, watching live, you'll see that we've just magically made Simon Walton appear <laughs> on the podcast. So uh, evening, Simon. Welcome to the Talking Shop podcast, mate. Um, traffic a bit of a nightmare in, in the big smoke? Mate, it never ceases to amaze me the amount of traffic down here. And obviously, with it being the end of the world tomorrow, it's even more chaos today. So, yeah, it took me a little bit longer than usual to get home. So I do apologise for being like No, that. mate, you, um, you can't account for traffic. Um, we are just discussing the Leicester game Um what what did you make of the game, um, Sime? Uh, did you did you think four one slightly flattered Leicester? Yeah, it, it did with regards to overall play, but it just was a little bit of a harsh lesson that mistakes are 
um, punished more ruthlessly against obviously top sides. Um, again, it, they weren't three goals better than us, um, but they just had that little edge that any mistake or any little lapse of concentration we seemed to have was was punished with a goal. But again, a little bit of a lesson probably um, that at this level and particularly against a, a top quality side like Leicester, the, the more mistakes you make, um, as is in football, the more chance you have of conceding goals and they certainly took their chance as well. Yeah, mate, absolutely. Just just touching on that first 30 minutes when it just felt very un leeds like we were all, we seemed to be a little bit disjointed. We couldn't make uh, we couldn't make decent decent passes. We couldn't you know, everything just didn't seem to be working. We we seemed to struggle with Barnes and, and Vardy's pace. The the conditions seemed to be testing us a little bit. I mean, as someone who's played, Simon, in that in that type of uh, atmosphere when you can feel it's kind of going wrong as a team. Is it just one of them where you just need to try and get your foot on ball for 10 minutes and just stem off the other team and, and get your confidence back? Yeah, that's when you need kind of your leaders, your more experienced players to... I know we're, we don't particularly slow a game down because we don't have slowing down a game in our, <laughs> in our um, locker. But at times like that, sometimes it does need just a little bit of a slow it down, get everyone together, regroup and it's going to happen. Let's let's uh, let's have it right. It's going to happen over the course of the season. It was probably a little bit of an eye opener and a little bit of a welcome to the big league kind of kind of game for us. I think. Um, but yeah, I think in those occasions, I mean, they had experienced players with regards to how many Premier League games they played. They're not the oldest of teams, but again, like I said, we can take a lot of lessons that when your back's against the wall a little bit against a team like Leicester, there comes a time where you have got to maybe just slow it down a little bit and get a few more bodies behind the ball and just build your way into a game um, instead of going hell for leather from the first minute because it could have been um, out of sight in those first 30 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought Vardy did a great job on, on Cop, to be honest. Um, a lot of work we played with Vardy at Stocksbridge Park Steels and we always take the piss out of him that Vardy got the move to Fleetwood and Carl scored two less goals than him and ended up at like one, one well main or something. Um, but I thought he old man cock. Um, it is in, he, you know, he, he was ratting around in him and just waiting for him to make a mistake and then jumped all over it, all, all over him, which he did do for the first goal. Um, the the other massive talking point uh, that we've not really covered, and I know young Ben's got a got a rant, um, a brewing. I can see it on his face. But the the VAR decision on the penalty now, um, it it was a little bit of a split. Split choice in the in the talking shit WhatsApp group because me and Young Ben was of the opinion that it was outside the box. I think a couple of the lads were of the opinion it were a penalty, but um, you know what, what do you think then, Young Ben? What did you make of the VAR decision? Because to be honest, I'd, I'd get up getting a shit by that point because I didn't think we were really <laughs> into the game. I won't I won't call it a rant. It's just it's just frustrating to me. It's definitely a foul, but it's outside the box. But it's a needless foul as well. There's no need to make that foul there, it, especially at that time in the game. You know. It, that game's getting wrapped up. We d they don't look to be any way back into it, and it just seems like a, a needless foul and a, a needless decision to have to make. Um, but you're outside the box and it want a penalty. That's just that's <laughs> simple, as simple as that. <laughs> um, Raggy, what did you reckon to the ref? Because up until that point, I thought he'd had a reasonably good game. You know what? I think he let a lot go. A let, he let a lot of those sort of challenges go all game, and I think that's why he let that one go. What I was surprised with him is when he goes over to the monitor and, and we've seen, I think, since they've reintroduced or, or introduced this going over to the monitor this season, I think it's only the, and I only know this from Twitter because it was a pay-per-view game, but um, there was a decision in the uh, is it spurs Brighton game where he goes over and he still sticks with his decision even though there's a clear foul or something. I, don't, I haven't seen that, so I don't know. But other than that, you know if he goes over, he's probably going to change his mind. It was the speed of the decision <laughs> Because he's right on, he's right on the foul of the foul, um, and he doesn't give it as a free kick. So he's gone over to that monitor and he's decided by looking at it once, it's definitely a foul. And it's definitely in the area on one camera angle. And he's just turned around and, and give it. And I thought that's a big decision to make. And I think at the minute now, it's just psychological with the ref. It's like if they're told in their ear, "Well, you might want to have a look at that again." They've been taught. It's like almost like you, you're wrong. Go over there just and go. All right, I'll give it over. That's the yeah. way I saw it as well. Sorry, as a, as a player who's played at a high level, how much would VAR get on your tits? <laughs> particularly, particularly a player for you, like yourself who like to um, 
get amongst it, shall we say. Um, how much would it do your head in that you'd feel like you had to like rein yourself in a little bit? And how much do you think it does play on players' minds? Because one thing I've noticed is in the Premier League, the the very adapt at making uh, the the slightest of touches look like penalties, free kicks, and stuff like that. I think now, like going on the point you've just said, people will make most of it because they know they've got more than one opportunity to win a penalty, if you know what I mean. like mm. The referee might not think it is, but if they do go over or it is a foul, in the back of their mind, you're thinking, well, there's two or three other people in an office or a, a studio who could give it. So I think it gives you more opportunity to try and win and buy a penalty or buy a free kick, as the saying goes. But yeah, from my personal point of view, I don't think I'd have stood much chance, to be honest. You know, the, the one where you make a tackle and you think, oh, I've got away with that one. There's none of that anymore because you're just waiting. You try, try to get off the pitch before some, the ball goes out of play so you don't get sent off. But I do, I definitely do think it has an impact, especially on attacking players because you've got more than one opportunity to, give a, to win a penalty or a free kick in a good area now because... Like I say, there's that many angles and that many people looking at it. And I, I don't agree. I, I know it's a split talking point throughout the whole world of football, but I don't agree that the on-pitch referee should be able to go and look at a monitor because it's taken out of his hands when he's made his decision, in my opinion. Um, if someone else changes his mind for him in a studio or whatever it is, that's different. But I think to allow a ref to then go and make it, whatever decision he'd made in the first place, to then change his own mind, I, I think can have the adverse effect because he doesn't want to look an idiot at the end of the day, does he? So mm. sometimes it's, I, I just hate it. I'll be perfectly honest. I hate the whole thing. And people can say that, yeah, but it's good. And it, it evens itself out. No matter what, it evens itself out over the course of a season, good and bad. So what I, I didn't see the point in bringing it in in the first place. Because you're still talking yeah. about it as much. Like we're still talking about everything as much as we was before. Well, that, that's still a controversial decision, isn't it? It's still... Yeah. It's still a subjective one that some people are saying it's outside the box. Some people are saying it is a foul, it's not a foul. It, it's not removing that element of it. Plus also, they played. how long did they play on before they even brought it back? That's what kills me, that bringing it back. And the thing, the thing that annoys about it, me about it the most is the goal situation. When you can have scored a goal, the elation's there, and then the next thing, nah, sorry, it's not a goal. That, that's what absolutely kills me. Um, but, yeah, I mean, luckily or unluckily, however you want to look at it, I didn't have to deal with that. So Yeah, yeah. The thing is, as well, like, I don't think it's really hit home for us as Leeds fans because we're not in the ground. So the point you've just made there, Simon, of, you know what Ellen Road's like when a, when a goal goes in for Leeds? It's absolute yeah. bedlam. And there's plenty of times I've celebrated, gone mad, and then stopped and looked up and Linesman's got his flag up. And that's probably yeah. the equivalent of what VAR is going to do to us when we finally get back into a, a stadium. And I, I must admit, I agree that the goal thing for me is, is beginning to sanitise and, and, and take the passion and love out of football because you're going to be kind of like, well, should I celebrate? Shouldn't I celebrate? And a quick look round, oh, he, he ain't got his flag up, but hold on a minute, like his, his toenail might be offside, they might bring it back here, so... Yeah, it, it don't it don't work great for me. And I had I had like double a double whammy because I went down to watch Gainsborough against South Shields last night in Gainsborough, and um, they were losing one nil, and it went into last minute. And South Shields had a very similar tackle inside the Gainsborough area, and the ref wave play on. <laughs> and needless to say, the Gainsborough fans weren't buzzing. I think is the is the answer. They'd have liked VAR, I think, at that point because from where I was sat, it looked like a. It looked like a nailed on foul, but anyway, that's it. I don't think it helped. I don't think it's helped the quality of refereeing. I mean, refereeing, so I don't think it's made referees any better in themselves, if that makes sense, because they're just given a helping hand by somebody else. I don't think it's actually improved the standard of individual referees. Not that I'm saying the referees are bad, but I don't, I can't see how it's kind of helped improve them because at the end of the day, it's a lot of the decisions are taken out of their hands because it goes to people elsewhere. So it's. No, mate, you're, you're, you're absolutely me. right, and not I think me. it. I think it takes it. It takes the need for them to make decisions, like you say. It takes the you know they don't need to make decisions because somebody in their ear will make it for them. So yeah. they become reticent to make you know decisions, but it's still not the championship, is it? Let's be honest. Uh, it's because the standard of refereeing down there is just absolutely appalling. I, I briefly watched the championship game the other day because I don't mess with that muck anymore. Now we're in Premier League. <laughs> and uh, the refing was just appalling again. But anyway, that's uh, that's. if you go back to listen to 
podcast episode 70 onwards, we just rant about refs on that one uh, <laughs> quite quite a bit. So uh, look, we'll look forward to Palace a little bit later on, but do we kind of just uh, bury the Leicester result as a as a learning lesson time? Do you think that's what the, the players will have done? They'll have gone in and, and done about 73 hours of analysis since and they'll put it down as, as experience? Yeah, I mean, this is going to sound stupid, but in the long term, it might not be a bad thing because let's all be honest, we were all getting carried away. We all thought we were competing with Liverpool and Man City to win the league at one stage. <laughs> so it may just be a tiny, the positive you take out of it is it may just be a little bit of a, a wake-up call, so to speak. Because Leicester, Leicester in, I, I spoke to you earlier, Leicester, in my opinion, are a t- top four team. Uh, what they do, they're, they're brilliant. I love watching them and they, they're going to do what they did to us, to a lot of other teams. Um, so, yeah, I think we can use it as a little bit of a learning curve. We can't make as many mistakes, can't afford to make many mistakes at this level. And there's still a lot of work to do for us to get to where Leicester are, which is evidently where we want to be eventually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for comments coming in for you, Sai. So uh, we'll hear from one of our sponsors and then we'll, uh, we'll we'll get into your ribs. One of them already, is that Sherbin in Elmer accent changed a bit. That's from uh, David Thornton. Um, so yeah, mate, we'll get into that in a minute. But before we go, uh, we better hear from one of our sponsors. So Raggy, um, as, a, as a father of a little girl, when's Christmas tree going up? My kids are already discussing it. Uh, is it allowed to dip after bonfire night? It's, uh, I tell you what, it's up at her mum's. <laughs> they put what? theirs up. Yeah, I know. Straight after, after Halloween. It's, uh, so I said, right, it's up at your mum's. It's not going up until Christmas Eve. Yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, fair one. But anyway, the point, the reason I mentioned Christmas trees is obviously our sponsors, the guys at the terrace, they're going to lead United up with Christmas. So if you check out their website um, at theterracestore.com, they've got some um, amazing uh, Marcelo Bielsa Christmas jumpers. I conveniently dropped the uh, the picture into my missus's WhatsApp last night when I was at the Gainsborough game. And she texts back saying, dream on which is the standard the standard reply obviously um and they're also doing some pretty cool little christmas trees in your favorite retro kit so um yeah check them out um info at the terrace uh, sorry terrastore.com don't forget you can still get your uh, talking shop mugs grady draw mugs many other things these guys are literally taking over the internet uh hats track suits hoodies uh card throws yeah, pillows Yo, God, the, the list is endless. Fridge magnets. But also, just to, to tag on as well, uh, myself, because uh, you know you guys um, who were with me all the time know I do these stupid things. Um, Carl messaged me and says, uh, as the terrace, uh, we're going to do 300K during lockdown to raise money for Calm, um, which raises money for, for mental health, essentially. So me and my infinite wisdom says, I'll tell you what, I'll do it with a 10K weight vest on, because that'll be ace. <laughs> and uh, currently, I'm sat on a cushion because my ass is killing from running around in this weight vest. So anyway, if you want to get involved in that, check out the terrace. Uh, Where are you putting media. the weight vest? <laughs> Say again, mate. Where are you putting the weight vest if your ass is it? What I didn't realise, like carrying an extra 10 kilograms around, you'd be surprised how much more work that is. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I naturally have 10 extra kilograms, yeah. so I know yeah. how, exactly how much hurt that hurts. I've learned that the last few years, that extra 10 kilograms, carrying that around killed me off. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you, want to, if you want to chuck us a quid, 50 pence, whatever, I do realise that it's tough times at the moment, people being furloughed and stuff like that. But if you want to chuck us a quid just to see me in agony, uh, mooching around with a 10k weight vest on, Check, check it out, but also uh, don't forget to check out all their great products on there. Loads and loads of good stuff. And in other news, Grady Draws has done our, all, all our artwork for us, and you know we, we've got a good relationship with Grady. and signed full-time for the Terrace, so we'll be doing artwork for them on a regular basis. So yeah, massive thanks to the lads um, and Carl's mum now as well at the Terrace for continuing to support us and go check the stuff out. So, right then, Simon, now's the time where we just grill the living daylights out of you. Mate, the go. first question I've got to ask you today is, does it slightly annoy you that whenever anybody says, oh, can you remember Simon Walton? The first thing people say is, oh, sent off against Valencia. Because um, <laughs> there's so much more to your game than just a sending off against Valencia. But like, I spoke to a few people today and they all said the same thing. Yeah, did you see? I even laughed before you finished. I knew what was coming already. <laughs> people don't realise I scored before I got sent off. Never get sent off. <laughs> I mean, um, I didn't help myself at times. Let's be perfectly honest about it. But um, no, it was um, it was a hell of a way to um, make my uh, entrance, shall we say? So yeah, I mean, scoring and getting sent off against. I think they were European champions at the time, so it's not a bad thing. Um, but I'm just glad people still remember me. So I'll take anything. 
Mate, it's a, it's a quiz question forever, that one. But um, <laughs> so t- taking you right back to for, from the start, so as has been mentioned in um, in the comments, you're from Sherburn in Elmet. So um, how did you find your way to, to Leeds United then into the to the academy there? Um, so I was from Garforth originally. I moved, my mum and dad moved out of Sherburn, so I was born and raised in Garforth. So um, eventually I moved out, my mum and dad moved out that way, just started playing for a local Sunday team and then, Got a trial at Leeds at 11, was that 10 or 11? Um, one of the went up to Boston Spa at the time because they did the trials at Boston Spa School um, before Four Patch was what it is now. And then did all right and then stayed there until, yeah, till I was 19. Um, and then obviously what happened happened and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I was surprised to find today that you started off as a left back. I literally played everywhere like as a kid. I mean, it was a little bit like that back then. I played everywhere, um, right back, which still haunts me to this day, obviously. People who have long memories will know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, and I played up front, right midfield, centre midfield, centre back. So, yeah, I was, I was the kid who kind of played everywhere. And then as I got older and it started getting more serious, like 15, 14, 15, 16 hours, a central midfielder or a centre back at times, but my, I applied my trade at centre midfield, believe it or not, which was not what people seemed to realise at the time. But yeah, I was I was quite versatile, um, believe it or not. Yeah, uh, we've got a comment coming in now, and I feel it'd be remiss of me not to mention it. But former guest of the show, I'm just going to flash it up on the screen if uh, my internet will work. Uh, Tom Clays, it's not working. Oh, yes, I can, I see, can it. see it. I can see oh, it. I can't see it. The kids are on the internet upstairs, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> but Tom said, "Sign me, old pal. Are you keeping? If I don't get a mention through your career, there's something wrong." So, uh, <laughs> were, were, you, uh, were you and Tom similar age group? Uh, no. Nah. Yeah, TC was a year uh, year older than me, so he was Aaron Lennon's age, um, and he used to torment me. I try and torment me on the coaches. Obviously, back then we used to all share the same coach, so he used to have a laugh and a joke and. TC was always a bit of a character and we used to bump into each other at games. So, yeah, I, I still remember you, Tom, don't we? <laughs> um, so, just just talk us through then, inside that. Because, um, obviously, we're all Leeds fans, all grown-up Leeds fans, and we'd have all loved to have been in your position. Although, having a slight peek behind the curtain at Academy Football, because my son was up at Leeds for a bit, I'm not sure as a kid I'd be able to handle the pressure if I'm really honest. But, you know, talking about, you know, when did you start training with the first team and when did it start coming on the horizon that, you know, you're going to be in and in and about, in and and around it? Yeah, so going back to your first point, I, I work within an academy now, um, a rival Premier League team who shall not be named because it won't go down particularly well. Um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a little bit different now. Even though Leeds was one of the best ones to be at at the time, I was quite lucky growing up. Um, we were the first one in the country to have the state-of-the-art training ground, what they have now, which back then was was the best in the country for a long, long time. Um, and then, yeah, to, to, to come through with some of the players, to be a younger 14, 15-year-old, seeing the players that were, that were there and seeing them around the building and watching them train and being ball boys on a Saturday and ball boy in the Champions League and... Europa League or UEFA Cup as it was back then it was it was an unbelievable place to be at and then I was quite uh, I made the best out of a bad situation obviously the last couple of years in the in the Premier League were um, up and down to say the least mainly down but I was quite lucky that a lot of younger players kind of half got a sniff and Eddie Gray came in towards the end of it and tried to integrate a few of the younger players. So I was lucky to get to train with the first team that final season a few times. And I was playing in the reserves, which back then was heavily, it's different to how it is now. If you didn't play on a Saturday for the first team, you played for the reserves. So you had big hitters playing. And we used to get thousands at Ellen Road or Wakefield or wherever it was we played. So back then it was an unbelievable place to be. I mean, and obviously myself being a massive Leeds fan, a season ticket holder home and away to to kind of be able to put that kit on and it, no matter what age or what game it was, it was always, it sounds corny and cringy, but it was always my dream come true. So I was quite lucky and I'll never, ever forget it. And I still remember the, the Derby game like it was yesterday. Um, I know my mum and dad do too. So yeah, I was I was quite lucky and fortunate that I was able to live my dream. It didn't go on for as long as I would have liked due to circumstances, but um, no one will ever take away from me that I managed to play forty odd, fifty odd games, whatever it was for my for my boyhood boyhood club. 
Yeah, we were we were discussing and trying to figure out the timeline because for me, it's, like, it's a bit of a funny time here because I kind of moved away. So being able to follow leads around this time were, were quite difficult. I also remember you breaking through, but sort of where in your career progression does the, the playoff a final against Watford, which I had blanked out my memory until literally about half an hour ago when I looked it up again. Where, where does that kind of fit? So that was the end of me, basically. Um, I've told this story before. It's not news to anyone, but we knew that if we didn't get promoted, that there would be massive changes, to say the least. Um, I've been told in no uncertain terms that if we didn't go up, the club needed to raise a lot of money. Um, I was a, a highly sellable asset at the time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I was... I was, I was, was obviously disappointed. Oh, disappointed is the biggest understatement ever. I was obviously heartbroken not to get promoted, but unfortunately it was a double knife in the heart to me because I, I kind of knew sat in that hotel in Cardiff after the game that that was it. My time was kind of up due to the, the people in charge at the time. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a double, triple, quadruple heartbreak for me. So that was the end of me. That was the last time I ever took part in the squad as, as, a, as a Leeds United player. So, like I've said, and like I've said many a times, I, I would give my right arm for it to finish differently. But football is, is just that. It can be cruel at times. Yeah, when um, when I was doing some research today, uh, Sai, one thing I noticed is that I'm a, I'm a big fan of Under the Cosh, the podcast. Uh, Michael Duber has just been on it this week. For any Leeds fans who have not listened to it yet, please do, because uh, I, I really enjoyed it. But... There's a couple of managers' names who keep popping up on that show. And one thing that struck me today is you've played for quite a few of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I, can't, I can't get away with it because I've, I've spoke to Simon Johnson before as well um, and, and this name comes up. What were your relationship and time like with Kevin Blackwell? <laughs> I knew again. I was smiling. I knew exactly what you were going to say before you said it. I, mean, I only say that, and as soon as you said under the cosh, I knew, because I watched the one with Killer the other day, Matt Kilgallen. Yeah. I hadn't seen Jubes' one, but I watched Killer's, and then I stumbled across Clark Carlisle's ages ago. So I hadn't watched John O's yet, but I, I know what relationship he had with Blackie, so I can imagine what he says. <laughs> um, my thing to Blackie will always be, I'll be grateful, I'll be thankful to him because of he gave me my opportunity, he believed in me as a 16-year-old. Um, he signed me again at Sheffield United when I'd hit rock bottom, I'd had injury after injury and had a, a shit time, so he signed me again at Sheffield United. So, But, but um, how he went about dealing with people at times, myself as a 16, 17-year-old uh, included, was not how I would treat um, a younger player in my current role. Um, he was old school. Um, it was different back then. It, it was. It really was. Um, some of the stuff that you did back then, if you did now, you'd, you'd end up in prison, never mind get sacked. So it's, it's a bit different. But I will always be grateful and thankful to him for what he did, for giving me, for making my dreams come true. But, and again, a massive but, how he sometimes dealt with me and trep me along with a few of the younger players was not how I would go about it now in, in my role of looking after younger players. Um, the the Sheffield United game being, a, being the head of it. Um, obviously, I got dragged before half-time. I felt that he could have waited three minutes till half-time to do it. Um, I wasn't the shyest of lads, so I said something at half-time, which wasn't um, the uh sensible of things to do and then i was suspended and suspended and barred from the training ground for two weeks so it's, it's things like that that um yeah it will always be and i know a lot a lot of people will say bad things and he that are especially around that time there's people who will bad mouth him because of how he was but from my point of view and for how he treated me i'll always be thankful and, and grateful and like i said he signed me again at chef united and Gave me a chance, which unfortunately didn't go too well because I bust my knee in my first game. But for me, I, I'll never say a bad word about him because, of because like I said, he gave me the opportunity to to live my dreams. But there would have been, like I said, if I if I had my time, I'd, I'd, I'd do it differently. Put it that way. Obviously, just I'm just I've got the team here from uh, I think it's 2004, 2005, and just looking at some of the young players who were kind of made as as make way as yourself included, but 
just just some of the names here of, of players who obviously moved on from Leeds after and some of the sort of leftover from the Champions League era. So obviously Gary Kelly, um, Lucas Radebe still around the club at that point. Obviously still the kind of hang, hang on, if you like, from, from the semi-glory days of the Champions League, if you can kind of call it that, because obviously it didn't go the way that he anyway, wanted it to. But uh, Seth Johnson as well, um, who's become a bit of a, a pantomime villain amongst the Leeds fans. And a little bit of it, when I when I read into him a little bit, I, I kind of feel sorry for him a little bit, because when he did manage to get through some injuries when he played in the in the, the following seasons after promote, you could see there was a little glimpse of, of something there, but I felt like his, his move to Leeds were always a little bit ill-fated because of obviously what, the connotations that went with the deal. Uh, but uh, other names, uh, Aaron Lennon obviously went on to have a reasonably recent career, didn't he? Um, he did <laughs> at that level. Uh, Eric Backer still obviously left over from the Champions League, but like David Healy, still Northern Ireland's top goal scorer of, of, of all times. I mean, you know, uh, Marlon King, I'm not too sure where he is nowadays, but you know, he was in there as well. Um, you know, what, what type of a squad was it? Because obviously the Champions League time, Doobes mentioned it on Under the Kosher, it was really tight. Um, we were starting to see Leeds struggling a little bit, didn't we? Where it were like all eggs in one basket. We needed promotion, otherwise we were in the the yeah. shit. Um, you know what were the what were the lads like around the place? Who were the characters in it? I've heard Kells was a bit of a character. Yeah, just a bit. I mean, the first year when I when I came through was was totally different to the second year. Um, it was literally chalk and cheese. The second year we had a settled squad. It was just the same players, same kind of 16, 18 every week with a few on the outside, myself included, who would come in. The first year, it was a different, I think it was a different team, different squad every single week. There were players coming in for a month and going. I mean, I dread to think the amount of players that got used in the first season. Um, but the older ones, like you said, um, Seth included, Eric included, they were just, they were, you, they were how you expect them to be. They were top, top lads. To me, they were brilliant as a young kid coming in. A young kid who sometimes got ahead of himself with regard to thinking he was um, not better than I was, but I wasn't shy. Put it that way. Um, so I was I was looked after. Um, they took me under their wings, particularly Kells. I'll always I still speak to him now and again. I've bumped into him in Leeds um, now and again. So I, I'll always be grateful to him. He, he used to say hello to my mum and dad. He used to make them feel welcome. It was just there were some real, real good characters in that, that kept, the first year particularly, that kept it together, because there was a lot of young lads, me, Killer, Aaron, Scott Carson, Fraser, the likes of John O. Woods, that, I, there was loads, let's be honest, there was, I must have been about 50 players used the first season, but those characters, Jukels, Jubes, Lucas, um, Eric Bacco, Seth, um, Neil Sullivan, I know he's not a hangover, it, it was his first season, but Paul Butler, people like that were, were brilliant for me as a young player and were, were brilliant to all the young lads, really. So it was them that kind of held it together the first season. And then the second season helped. You had the likes of Sean Derry, Rob Hulse, Richard Creswell, David Healy had had uh, six months before. So that it was just the, re the second season was frustrating for me because I kept getting injured and played here and there. And then I was supposed to go on loan and then got sent off in a reserve game we got a five game ban so I didn't <laughs> didn't end up so it was just one of those seasons but the spirit and the camaraderie which led to us uh, evidently we lost in the final but it led to a pretty successful season which ended in disappointment but I think we, we should looking back have got promoted automatically that season but the lads around it there weren't many bad eggs and the bad eggs in the first season soon got kicked out and I'm sure you can imagine there a few of those works they didn't hang around or last very long yeah um, obviously sold to Charlton uh, mm. big move for a young lad to go from obviously Yorkshire playing for your your boyhood club to the big smoke and, and Charlton um, were there any other offers on the table or you know were Charlton the only chance yeah, it was different. Again, I've, I've, people know this. The first summer after I'd played and done well, um, again, I'm going to name drop. There was Liverpool, Everton. Um, who else? There was Tottenham when Aaron Lennon went. Um, there was a few that I could have gone in the first season, but I didn't think it was right. My advisors at the time didn't think it was right. I didn't want to go anywhere, so they kind of got rebuffed. Um, the club said, look, 
it's up to you. These are unbelievable opportunities. What do you want to do? I was like, no, we turned, we didn't want to leave. We was happy where we was. Um, I was just unfortunate to get a serious injury playing for England under 19s in the European Championships over the summer, which killed my pre season. And I never really got back into it. And then the second season, didn't play as many games. Um, January came, there was a couple of offers, but again, the club weren't that fussed about letting me go at the time. I didn't want to go and then Mr Bates came in um, I've done well not to swear and call him another name then um, <laughs> <laughs> he's got a different name when I'm not on uh, not on the phone um, but yeah he came in and then obviously at the end of that season as I've said many times I, I didn't have a choice I always get asked do you regret leaving Leeds and I can't say yes because I didn't leave in my opinion I didn't have a choice so I didn't really leave I, I had a year left on my contract uh, I'd been offered a new improved one in January. Um, we're supposed to sign it at the end of the season. There was a Premier League contract and a Championship contract. So whichever one I'd signed, that got pulled. Um, and it was made in no uncertain terms that I would I would be sold no matter what. So it was then just about picking the right club. Um, the, the clubs weren't as big, shall we say, because I'd not played that many games. Um, there was still Charlton had just I think they'd just missed out on the UEFA Cup, so there weren't it were I wasn't moving sidewards in my opinion in football terms I was moving up. Mm-hmm. Um, there was Charlton, I think Fulham, West Brom, Everton again. Um, there was a cup. I think I had five to choose from, and Charlton I went and met them. They just it was a brilliant club at the time. <laughs> Not so much now, apparently. But yeah, it was a, it was a brilliant club at the time. It was a steady club. Kirbishley had been there for years. They'd always done well. They always give young players chances. And then, like I said, it, it just seemed to be kind of a pattern for the next few years that these clubs that I went to thinking were good kind of went tits up. Maybe it was maybe it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate. I've got your I've got your list of clubs here. Um, so Charlton, then alone to Ipswich, nineteen appearances and three goals. Uh, loan to Cardiff and then joined QPR. Uh, one quite well, it's not funny, but one story I saw today was that um, Palladini rang you up and said he was selling it to Plymouth and manager and assistant manager didn't know not about it. Is that is that true? Yeah, we had a pre- this was the second season. We had a um, this was when again when I signed for QPR, nice club, lovely family club. Used to love playing at Loftus Road, thought I'd still go there now. I think it's a proper ground for yeah, that, that that'll do. Met the manager, I broke my leg, bone came through my leg in the first game. Um, Jeez. sorry if you're sorry if you're having your dinner, but yeah, it came through. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then by the time I got back, it turned into a TV show. Um, Bria Tori and Bernie Eccleston had taken over. We had supermodels in the in the bar. Um, so it wasn't a bad time to be injured at the time. So <laughs> used, used, used to get there early, funnily enough, and go and hang around in the um, executive lounge or whatever it was. So by the time I came back, it, it was a TV show. I mean, I don't know if you've seen a documentary on it. I think it's called The Four or Five Year Plan. That's just that's the PG rated. The some of the stuff that went on at that club is unbelievable. But yeah, it was um, that. Unfortunately, just kind of again, kind of summed it up to to get a serious injury on my debut was was not not. It didn't go to plan. Yeah. No, and then um, uh, alone to alone to Hull. Nice, yeah. nice, nice neck of the woods, Hull. Um, <laughs> and then joined Plymouth. Now uh, <laughs> this was another funny bit of the story that when I was doing some research today that uh, you featured in the manager at the Times book who will not mention who the manager were but I think he he said some of words to the fact you were the biggest mistake he'd ever made yeah he must have had not not had many nights out then surely (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah it was I think uh, yeah, it was the worst or uh, most expensive. Well, that's generally both, isn't it? The most expensive is generally the worst. But yeah, I um, I cost the club then quite a bit of money. Um, we didn't see eye to eye. I had a bad start. Um, got sent off after three or four minutes at Barnsley away for um, stupidity. And then it was it was downhill from then on. But I, I, I brought it back around. I ended up spending the last two years there as captain and did all right. So... Event. I wouldn't say they got the money out of me eventually, but I kind of made, made it up a little bit. But <laughs> yeah, um, it was. I mean, I've, I've done, not sure I've made anybody else's book, but it was. I suppose it's good that he remembers me. 
<laughs> yeah, true. And then um, a move to Vegas of the North, Blackpool. Um, and then a, a, a loan at Crew. And then, like you said before, Blackwell took you to Chef United. And then um, Artlepool, 73 appearances for Artlepool. And uh, am I right in thinking you roomed with Nick Bambi's son having played with Nick Bambi at Hull as well? Yeah, that was surreal um, at the time. <laughs> It was actually wasn't even that far apart either. What was Hull about three or four years before? So was, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so I bet that's not happened many times. But yeah, in between, like I said, I'd gone to Sheffield United and ruptured every ligament in my knee in my first game again. Um, so I've not had the best of luck at times. Um, get, get the violins out. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of, without being disrespectful to the clubs that I went on and played for after the Chef United debacle when I'd done my knee and was out for a year, the kind of, that was the beginning of the end. Not the end, because I, I had a, a fair few more years after that, but with regards to my top, kind of top flight career, that was the big, that was, yeah, the beginning of the end, basically. Did you start like really worry, be worried about your debut? Because it just sounds like every debut where there was some massive incident. I should have known actually when I got sent off, shouldn't I? I yeah, exactly. That. Um, yeah, maybe. To be fair, I, I started getting injured then before my debut, so I had to say I started earlier. But yeah, yeah, I, um, I never started particularly well, but I kind of grew into it wherever I went. I don't know why, because I, I never particularly hit the ground running. I always. I signed for Stevenage, but we'd had a court case, not court case, that sounds bad, but over the summer, hardly put, I'd got sent off. Um, <laughs> there's a picture of me, actually. I, I, I'll WhatsApp you it. Uh, Patrick Bamford was on loan at MK Dons, and I accidentally fell over him and trod on him by accident. <laughs> <laughs> And got I got I got sent off in that game, so it went to a review and got extra games. So the start of the following season, I missed the start of the season. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I never started particularly well, but it always got kind of got better. Hey, you might you might make Paddy's book. <laughs> yeah. He won't remember. He won't remember me. But yeah, there's a picture. I didn't find it. Funnily enough, an old uh, media uh, media guy from Hartlepool sent me the picture not so long ago. Obviously, because he's fine at the minute. And uh, he credited me for the making of him. I mean, I'm not sure that's true. But, <laughs> but funnily enough, in that same game, Alan Smith was playing for MK Dons. So it was, um, obviously, I know Smudge from before. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a bit of a... I think that was my last game for Hartlepool. So, yeah, it didn't go particularly well. But, um, yeah, we won. Uh, uh, I don't think Paddy scored, so I must have done half a job on him. I think he still had six of my studs in his ribs at the time. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, just just to pick a few out, I, I'm pretty sure, but I can't be hundred percent. I think mine and your paths crossed in 2016 when you made six appearances for Garforth. I was yeah. at um, Osset Town. I think we 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 met each other in a in a pre-season friendly. And I'm thinking, <laughs> that's Alan Walton playing for Garforth. But uh, I weren't too sure, so I don't, I don't come and approach you. Um, yeah. And then, sort of coming up to modern day, mate, um, Averton, Averton and uh, Waterlooville. Yeah. Um, still still there, still playing or? Uh, I'm not playing. I've, I've, I've signed there, well, went there last year as player coach. I've kind of the last three seasons have gone over to the coaching and management side so last year I was registered as a player coach played a few games but was more on the coaching side this year again I, my name's down as a player but I've not played yet I'm first team coach there so I've, I've enjoyed the coaching obviously with the club legend that is Mr Ian Baird there as well so we, we talk about Leeds um, pretty often and we always get a text when the games are on so yeah it's, uh, it's nice I'm enjoying it I am really enjoying what I'm doing at the minute I mean obviously it's a it's a far old way from the days playing at Ellen Road in front of 30 odd thousand. But no, what I'm doing at the minute, I'm, I'm quite enjoying where I'm heading. Yeah. And, and the thing is, mate, as well, you did what thousands, hundreds of thousands, I, I dare say probably a million. You got to live out your dream and play at Ellen Road. So, you know, whether it's yeah. 50 appearances or five appearances, you got to do what any of us would have mm. given us left foot and half a bit of talent to be able to do it. So. Yeah, yeah. I never, um, I'll never take that for granted ever. Like I, I don't, and people wind me up. Whatever club I've been, they'll always go. Oh, he's on about Leeds again because I'll never, <laughs> I never ever take it for granted. It was just a shame that the I, I reached my peak at sixteen, seventeen. It didn't get any better after that. But still, it was um, no. Nah, I never take that for granted what I did, and to be able to even when I go and watch now, I go home and away. Like I take my daughter. I took my daughter to Reading away, and uh, we won one nil. 
And I told her that's why I scored my first league goal. I think she's pretty, I'm pretty sure she thinks I was talking rubbish. <laughs> I, I, I did try to, I, mean, I have played for Leeds here. I did score, honestly. So I, I think she told me to stop lying the first time. I had to show her the video. But um, yeah, I, um, I never, I'll never take it for granted. And to be able to have done that and still get asked to do things like this it is massive for me. And I, I do get a real buzz out of it. I mean, a lot of a lot of professional players will say, you know, I, I supported them as a boy, or, or you know, an have a boy or club, and then go on to play for for lots of different teams. Obviously, you've mentioned quite a few times that you're a massive Leeds fan, and and you know, and you started at Leeds. What? How did it feel like, you know, playing professionally? Did, you mentioned there, like, uh, you, you'll never take it away, and we, you know, we can never imagine what it's like to pull on. Yeah, you know, a professional football shirt, never mind a Leeds United shirt. But did it feel different playing for Leeds than it did any other club? Or does it just kind of, it just all, as a professional, you just, you're just playing football, you're just playing football? No, I think it did feel different because I got it, as you can imagine, every time I went home or I'd go and watch my brother and our sister play on a Sunday morning at the local team, it was, you always, you couldn't get away from it, if you know what I mean. I didn't want to get away from it. I was 16, 17, so I, playing for Leeds I was, I was buzzing <laughs> I would tell anyone but you couldn't get away from it like obviously living in Leeds being a Leeds fan seeing people at games um, still having a season ticket because I didn't think I'd be anywhere near the first team so <laughs> stuff like that it was it was I was young so you probably don't realise at the time I've said this in an interview before I probably look back at more pride now than I did when I was 16, 17 because at that time you're a kid and although like I said I'll never forget it and I was proud of what I did back then but looking back at it now you probably as a more mature adult you probably get more of a sense of, of pride than you did at 16, 17 running around just smashing people and then pumping the badge whenever you could. <laughs> Mate what was it like for your parents? I've just got to bring this point up because like I, I felt I'd take my son all over now he's, he's football barmy yes. and um, I kick every ball I'm that, I'm that parent who like I have to not overtly coach him from the side, but like encourage him best I can. I'm probably the noisiest on sidelines by by far, but not one of them overbearing parents who's telling them to play a flat back four and stuff like that. None of that. Um, <laughs> but like I sat at the side of Will Huffer's mum. I know Will Huffer's obviously left Leeds now and he's just gone to Bradford Park Avenue. So good luck to him there. But I sat at the side of his mum in the one senior appearance he made for for the club. And she looked to absolutely hate every minute of it because as soon as the ball went near him, she shit her pants, started sque screeching. She got past at least three glasses of wine to try and take the edge off. I mean, what were it like for your parents as massive Leeds fans to see the sun? And I mean, you know, what were it like for them when you were getting stick and stuff like that? I've always wondered this, to be honest, because I think it would do my head in. Yeah, but I think, obviously, again, I think they'll never... My debut couldn't have gotten any better, not the Valencia one. We won. It was a nice sunny day. We had Derby at home, big occasion. We won 1-0, came out. So, I, I don't think they'll ever forget that day. I think my mum says even my dad shed a tear that day. So, that pretty much sums it up. But there's been stories. Um, there has, it wasn't all plain sailing. And again, because you're invested in it a little bit more probably as a parent because they were Leeds fans and obviously I'm their son. It, at times, there was stories, there was things that happened that um, wasn't nice for them. Um, I have to mention Martin Sykes, who obviously works down there. He's by the tunnel. He used to look after my mum and dad. Um, and I was always grateful for him. They'd always make a point of going and standing next to my mum and dad um, at away games. Um, I'll never forget we played Birmingham away in the FA Cup. We got beat, but I come outside and my mum was drenched. That hair was drenched. The clothes. Were drenched. So I said, "What happened to you?" So I went down for a coffee at half time, and everyone was throwing beer and that around. She got drenched. So yeah, <laughs> I remember that. It must be in the FA Cup. So yeah, I mean, they, they came everywhere. My dad. I mean, my dad used to go to Millwall away by himself. He, he tells a story still where. He, he parked in a car park and walked the wrong way down the tunnel and he was by himself. So he, he went everywhere and my mum went when she could. So, yeah, the, it was, I mean, they would have loved it watching me step out in a, in a Leeds kit. But, yeah, as a parent, there were, there were things that went on and not just a parent. I've got a, a, a younger brother who was fiery, to say the least. So was, <laughs> there was the odd occasion, uh, yeah, I'd come outside and he'd be sat outside the ground and I was wondering why he was sat outside it. But, yeah, it was... Um, they just wanted the best for me and 
like I'm sure if, if you stood on the side and heard people say certain things about your child, it's never nice. But my mum and dad were quite sensible to know that it's going to happen no matter where you are. It's, it's part of football. I go now and I've probably said stuff, I'll be honest, I've probably stood at away games and said stuff where if someone's stood around me, they'll be thinking, shut up. But um, yeah, it was, it, I, I'm sure they were proud, but it, as a parent, I, I can appreciate what they will have gone through on, on both sides of it as well. It's not all roses, um, let me tell you that. Yeah, um, I've, I've only got one parent story. I was playing for a team, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in Barnsley, Simon, for if you don't know, but um, I will play for a team <coughs> from Barnsley. I'll keep this really loose rather than um, drop any names in. <coughs> and we played... Um, over in West Yorkshire, uh, it rhymes with Buddersfax. Um, and um, we're midway through the game to turn around to one of the fan, one of our parents of one of the lads having a full on scrap with one of the other fans from the other team. And when I say scrap, I'm not talking like handbags at dawn, I'm talking like shirt overhead, full hockey, like uppercutting him. And we're all going, Well, what do we do? And like, oh, just carry on playing. And the game went on for about five minutes and this brawl just ensued on the other side and left them to it. I was like, wow. And that was all over the same thing. One of the fans that said something about the lad who were playing for us, his dad took umbrage to it and ended up having a bit of a front crawl, uh, a thorn outside at pitch, which was nice. Yeah, it's not nice, is it? But it's all part of football and I think they learned. I mean, plenty of fans shouted stuff at me over the years, so I think they got used to it in the end. Yeah. I mean, my, my dad probably shouted worse stuff to me during games at times anyway. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely right, mate. We'll let you have a break, but we'll get you back in in a bit to talk about the Palace game. Um, in other Leeds United news then, some sad news this week, and um, I put it in the group and it came as a bit of a surprise to me, but uh, former centre-half, um, former Hearts centre-half, Rangers centre-half, uh, Marius Zaliukis has sadly passed away at the age of 36. Um, I tried to do a bit of digging around. Um, the only report I could see that he may have got motor neuron disease, which obviously is... Quite prominent in Leeds news at the moment with obviously Rob Burrows's battle against the disease. So um, you know, terribly sad. Thirty six, no age, Perfect, for him, yeah. no for age him to, to lose his life. And I know, you know, we've jested on this show about him before, but you know, we don't wish ill on anybody. And you know, he still adorned the famous white shirt. So you know, we send our best regards to his family. Um, in other news, Rodrigo has tested positive for COVID nineteen. Um, he didn't look particularly ill on his Instagram picture, giving it the thumbs up like he just won a competition, uh, a little bit like Borat. Um, so he misses the Palace game, as we touched on earlier. It's uh, this coming up uh, on Saturday. Looking towards Palace then, Si, um, they've had a bit of an indifferent start to the Premier League. Um, beat Man United 3-1, which you know will always put me in Leeds United's good books. Uh, got beat by Everton, who were flying at the time. Got, got dicked by Chelsea 4-0. Drew one apiece for Brighton, beat Fulham 2-1 and then lost 2-0 to Wolves. Um, what do you expect from this game on, on Saturday? Because I think Leeds will want to prove a point that the Leicester game were a one-off. Yeah, I mean, I'm not too far from Crystal Palace. So there's a fair few Crystal Palace fans around where I live. So they're not overly impressed with how they're doing this season. Um, I think Palace will always be Palace. They'll be they'll be all right. I, I, they, they play the same way. They have decent enough players, but... I don't see why it's not a good... Well, we never change our style of play whoever we play against, so that don't matter. But I think it will be another test um, for us. Um, a way at an established Premier League team who always seem to find a way of getting results. Um, but yeah, I think, again, it's a game that this is kind of the level... Not the level, this is say, I don't mean this to sound... That's kind of the level we're at at, Pal at Palace. I would say we're both in that 10th to 14th kind of group, I would say. So, yeah, it's, it's a game that we we should be looking to get a positive result. It's not a it's not a free hit by any stretch, but these are the games where Palace are a possession-based team. Um, I assume we'll have plenty of the ball. Um, they're quite well organised, um, although I didn't particularly look it in the Chelsea game, which I watched, but they always seem to be well organised. They'll play the same shape. They'll have the same, no matter who plays, they all seem to do the same job. So, I think we'll have plenty of possession, as we always do. Um, I just think we have to be a little bit cuter. I think teams at this level will start working us out. Um, obviously, the, the, the higher you go, again, this will sound pretty simple, but the higher you go, you're playing against better players, better managers, better staff, 
so they will have done as much analysis. Um, we aren't the only team that do analysis. The teams will start working out how to nullify us, as Man City tried when they put a man on Calvin Phillips. Obviously, that makes no difference this weekend because he's not fit, but we have to become a little bit cuter and aware to these things to, to have a plan B, so to speak. But I think at the minute, Palace, I would say we're on a, a, an even keel. We're in that same bracket as them at the minute, so it'll be a good gauge in my eyes to see where we where we are against against the team that are. Yeah, I saw, I saw a little bit of Palace news earlier. They're missing their captain, uh, Reedwald, I think. Murder his name there, but I think it's along the line. So they're missing him. But obviously still got big players in, Michi Bashwai and Wilfred Zaha. I've not heard if uh, either of them are missing amongst uh, a few others in there as well. So, yeah, got, got to be on his guard. But I, I'm kind of hopeful for a for a, a, a positive result at Sellers Park. What, what do you reckon? Raggy, I think I think Sellers Park's one in places that it'll be a negative fact of them that fans are not in the place, to be honest. Yeah, but we never do well in London, do we? It's like the London curse, you know. It's um, we've just got to break that hoodoo. Um, they don't they don't play a very attacking style of play, do they? Uh, like like you say, because they're not going to going to get um, the fans out of the seats. But obviously, they're not in in there at the minute. Um, it'd be interesting for me how we. How we kind of level up in midfield, whether we stick with the Klitsch and Shackleton pairing um, or whether we go back to, to Stuart coming in in that Calvin Phillips role, uh, that'd be interesting. I thought Stuart could get another chance um, against Leicester and uh, I don't think it particularly worked and obviously Shackleton uh, coming off. But again, it's a different game, isn't it? Um, but I... Um, yeah, it's a it's a good test, and we need to bounce back. And yeah, Simon's right. We need to just we ex we need to just execute a little bit better, um, not make the the mistakes at the back, and uh, just and pass you know pass a lot better than we did in that first half uh, against Leicester. Yeah, um, how would you go with it, Young Ben? Bring Stroke back in, or leave the Klitsch Shackleton centre pairing? Yeah, I mean, Stroke were, were, were unlucky against Villa, you know, to, to pick up that booking with that challenge on Grealish very, very early on. Um, I do rate him and his, I think his passing ability is, is great. Um, you know, against Palace, it's going to be a game where we probably do need to be a little bit more patient because they are very rigid, you know, they're very, very organised. Um, and I do think that having having Cock and Struick in the team who can ping them balls uh, out wide, I think it'd be a massive benefit to us. Um, but... On the other hand, you know, you saw when, when it changed at Villa, when we did drop click back and brought Shaq in, it, it worked. Um, so, you know, I, I think I, I do think Stroke deserves a chance, but I won't be surprised to see a set up like with against Leicester again either. Yeah, I think the other bit of team news as well, Rafinha obviously missed out um, due to an ankle knock against Leicester. But I think, um, I'm sure I saw Phil here or maybe someone else mentioned that he was still in training, so it weren't keeping him out of training, so he might have just been a precautionary thing. So, um be interested to see if he comes uh, back onto the bench and gives us another option from there. Um, I, I'm really keen on seeing him getting some minutes, to be honest. I'm quite excited by Rafinha. And I think taking nothing away from Elder Costa and his start to the season, but I do see Rafinha possibly being the long-term right midfielder um, when he gets into the swing of things and, and you know gets a chance and cements his place. Um, Sai, before we get some predictions for the game on Saturday... Um, what have you made of Leeds' transition to the Premier League? Obviously, we're suffering a little bit from injuries at the minute where Llorente and Phillips and obviously Cooper's had a real stop-start start to the season, which will not have helped him. But, you know, what have you made to the to the um, time back in the Premier League? I think it's we were never we were never going to change how we played. I think that that's not a surprise to anybody. Um, I think it's a surprise to me to... Uh, the level we've been able to carry it out, um, the style never changed, but the, the levels that we've been able to perform at, although not consistently, the levels we've reached were probably far better than what anybody expected, to be honest. I don't ever think anybody thought we were going to outplay Man City for 45 minutes, did we? And we didn't step away from what, we, what got us promoted last year. Um, and again, it's all credit to the staff. We've added a couple, but it's the players who have been there for the last few years who have also made the step up seamlessly. The la I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure any of our players, apart from maybe Patrick Bamford on the odd occasion, held a cost on the odd occasion, had played any Premier League football at all. I mean, I might be wrong. 
I don't I think know. The, the public I, I done my research. Bit of I don't know, um, but I just Pablo I played a bit at Swansea, and obviously Patrick Bamford had, had a few games. Um, yeah, and that was that. That's been it. Oh, Rodrigo, the odd game against uh, for Bolton on loan when he were nineteen. Other than that, no, no one. I just think it's been. If you'd have asked anybody at the start of the season to be in the position we're in now, I think you'd have you'd have snapped round off. Let's be honest. Um, if someone had a, had a give me. 10th at the start of the season and I just said yeah no problem I'll take it now but I, I it didn't I say surprised and it didn't surprise me I knew we weren't ever going to change our style of play I knew it wasn't going to be a whole different type of Leeds team to what we'd seen the previous two years because as we know um, Mr Bielsa only kind of has one way of, of playing and he won't stay away stray away from that but I it has it has surprised me a little bit to the levels we've been able to achieve. And like I said, if, we, if we'd achieved that level every minute of every game, we'd be right at the top of the league. But to be able to prove that we can reach those levels at times has, has surprised me, to be honest, against the quality of opposition that we've played. Um, and although a 4-1 defeat against Leicester doesn't look good, um, again, cutting out the silly mistakes, we, we weren't far off it. It was just they, they were more ruthless in there execution and taking the chances when they when they had the ball but I think we, we, we will learn and we will get better um, I think we will have to because teams will figure out how to stop us playing um, so I think we will learn I think at times we may have to see slightly different ways of playing or formations or whatever it is I mean you go back to Mentioning striker Shruik, um, he would play for me just because he had a bit of physical presence against the Crystal Palace team. Um, again, that might be a bit old school of put your big ones in for the big teams, but I just <laughs> think you have to have a little bit of physical presence in there. Obviously, not having Calvin in makes a, a massive difference to any any team. Um, so to try and plug that gap with a little bit of physical presence would be my preference. But now, like I said, it's. Leicester was probably a little bit... No one's getting carried away. It's not panic stations by any stretch of the imagination because, like I said, if, if you'd have been offered um, the start that we've had at the start of the season, you'd have absolutely jumped over the barbed wire for it. So, yeah, I've been I've been pleased um, and also, like I said, surprised by the levels we've been able to reach. So, if we do that more often, who knows? But, yeah, it's uh, it's been a good start overall and, I'm sure everyone's encouraged and it'll all be a case of more of the same and they'll keep working and working and getting better because, like I said, they're going to have to because teams will figure out how to play against us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I think it's time we put our balls on the chopping block and uh, start putting our money where our mouths are and do a bit of this. Raggy's Predictor. Um, another pathetic round of Raggers Predictor last week. Uh, absolutely everyone, uh, apart from our guest, which was uh, Fenners from Soccer AM, he went. He, he didn't go for a Leeds victory. We all went for a Leeds victory, but he didn't go for a Leicester either. He went 2-2. Two, two. So nobody picks up any points. Um, so that still means that Gaz, Old Ben and Young Ben are out in the lead on six. I'm on four. Paddy's still bringing up the rear on three. Um, I haven't He's got the, the footballer. Two. He's meant know, to know, know shit. He don't know nothing. Clearly, <laughs> we don't clearly know anything. We've <laughs> we ain't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't got their predictions for this. I'll, I'll get them uh, them offline. The, the two missing, the old Ben and Paddy. Uh, but how do we see this one going? Um, I'll start with you, Gary. As soon as you're winning. Cheers, Rags. Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to go for a 2-1 win. 2-1. Tight game. I'm going for a tight game. Ben? I'm going to go for a tighter game and say 1-0. One 1-0. All. One all. I'm going 2-0 leads. Simon? I'm going right out there. I'm going to go 3-1 leads. 3-1 leads. Like it. Like the confidence. Excellent. I'll tell you how it goes. We'll go, we'll go one nil up. Then we'll they'll equalise. Then we'll get two one. Then they'll start chasing it. We'll score a third in like the 90 odd minute, I think. I'd take that. 
It's not bad, but Simon can't have any more points for getting that right, by the way. <laughs> we, had a, we had a mail last year, but guess romped it by about 15 points, so we can't have that happening again. Um, moving on then to our favourite segment, and we, we struggled this week, to be honest, to find some shit houses of the week. Like I don't think anybody's really pissed us off, or certainly not in a, in a football in... Uh, not anybody. We're getting a bit like broken records talking about certain pundits and stuff. So I felt like we had to change the tune. So th this week's uh, nominations are um, the constant drivel from certain uh, commentators uh, about can Leeds keep it up? It's such lazy journalism. Can Leeds keep it up? We've come from the championship where you've got a 46 game season. We're in the Premier League where you don't play as many games as the championship. And we kept it up in the two seasons in the championship. Like, just can we just talk about something else? Like, I don't know. Just let's talk about if Bielsa's going to sit on a cup of tea or something again. Let's not keep <laughs> asking if Leeds can keep it up. It's utter bollocks. It was even it was even said, I think it was Alan Smith who was on CoComs on, uh, on the Leicester game. He even said, oh, I think the uh, I think the break for COVID helped Leeds not, not you know, not burn out last year. And I thought, we went into that, we won in the, winning the last five. We were still, we were still out running everyone. Um, if anything, it broke our it broke our momentum because when we came back, we we lost the first game back against Cardiff. So if anything, the the break the break didn't help us at all. Like you say, it's just lazy. It's lazy journalism. The L always say that against the teams who get promoted and start off well. The first thing that gets labelled out of me is well, they keep it up. It's just yeah, not for me. Yeah, true. Um, next one. Bit of a theme to these, by the way. I'm just looking at some <laughs> uh, Martin Tyler, right? Martin Tyler, um, obviously a legend of the uh, commentary game, um, and a Man U fan, uh, which I can confirm is 100 percent true. But after we got beat by Leicester, he spun our start to the season to make it sound dreadful. Where he went, um, yeah, home form, one win in four, or some along them lines. And we're like, hold on a minute, you shit house. We've had a decent start to the season. Just because we've got beat by Leicester 4 1, doesn't mean you can spin it on its head. Yeah, one, one winning four. Rub your knob. Give it, put some, you know, put some thought in it. Anyway, so he's in there for that, for being a Man U fan on that. Um, and then uh, a sad one for us, but we've got to stick Luke Aylin in there for that, for the dive on um, on Paddy's body double, Christian Fuchs. Um, <laughs> To be fair to him, he doesn't appeal a great deal. He gets up, and we're led to believe that he apologised afterwards to Paddy's body double about his, his dive. He's tried to initiate the contact. He's just forgot the contact bit. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, unfortunately... It's one, them, it's one of them where, when it, when it first happens, you're screaming for a penalty because you're thinking, there's no way he's thrown himself down there because he, you know, he's through. He's, he's going to be able to get across. And then when you actually see the replay, you go... Why has he done that? Yeah. Why has he done that? That's the annoying thing because he definitely could have made it to the byline and put a ball into the box. Put, put he, he definitely in. could, instead, he just flopped to the floor. Yeah. He has a great knack, and I don't want to give his secrets away, so I hope no one's watching. He wins the most free kicks in the best positions out of anyone. He does the old one that I've done many a time. I'm going to get my body across a little bit, slow down a bit. As soon as he touches me, I'll jump on the ball because the referee will always give it, and he takes off so much pressure. Yeah. Well, I hope no referees are watching now. I've adopted <laughs> it. I've adopted it in my five side career as well. <laughs> it's just when it's, it's just when a lad that's half size is it behind you and you just flop the floor. Look like you're a dickhead. It's the <laughs> most annoying yeah. thing. The person who gives a free kick away, it's the most annoying thing for them because they all do the same thing. They lift their arms in the air. I never touched him, but he's very, <laughs> he's very clever. Um, some seventeen-year-old did it to me in Sunday League once. Just backed in and fell on the floor. Well, like, it's not going to work, son. You might have seen that on the telly. Get up. <laughs> right, have you seen? Have you seen? Ref is about forty stone. He stood in corner. He ain't moving. He's definitely not giving that. Get up and carry on playing, son. And take them white boots off. The pathetic. Um, so yeah. So then in there, I was gonna, I was gonna nominate my wife as well for constantly putting Piers Morgan on my telly on the morning, but um, I feel like that's a bit of a wasted vote. So, so lads, then um, the constant drivel from commentators of all, you know, quite a few of them. Uh, Martin Tyler for spinning our form on its head to making it sound like we're in free fall. And uh, our very own Luke Aylin for that dive. Who, who are we giving it to? As much as it pains me, uh, I might have to say Luke Aylin because he definitely could have got to the byline and put a ball in. Yeah. Well, let's face it, we, we, give, we, give enough, we give players like Grealish enough hammer on this, don't we? So uh, they're throwing themselves down. So, yeah. Even our own players. 
So do you have a thought either way? Or you not really right. like I mean, we, we have to remember still that although we're uh, people have been quite complimentary about us, people don't like Leeds. They don't like us. So when Martin Tyler says that, we have to remember, don't get caught up and think everyone likes us all of a sudden. Nobody likes us. So that's just mm -hmm. a little reminder that those Man United fans or whatever have a, still have a little thing in the back of their mind. So I, I don't mind that. It's, it wasn't nice being loved all the time. It felt a little bit strange, I'll be honest. <laughs> I'm going with the boring old will they keep it up because it's the same thing as soon as a team that comes up does well it's everyone asks the question that it's an easy cop out will they keep it up will they do well and yeah. hopefully um, it won't come back to bite me in the ass but I'm pretty sure we will be able to keep it up throughout the season <laughs> Yeah, there's your soundbite right there. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to um, Class 5 of uh, Summerfield's primary school. When I go pick my daughter up every day, as soon as I turn the corner, at least six lads in her class all shout, A boo Leeds! So I get my um, I get my fill of anti-Leeds biased um, up here in Barnsley, every school run, which is, it makes me laugh every time it happens, to be fair. I, just, I cheer them now, it's, uh, it's welcomed. But yeah, so... Um, I'm going to vote for the constant drivel as well. It does particularly irritate me, to be honest, that it's just lazy journalism. They've not looked into it. They've not looked at the form. Um, but it's a step up from the championship where we had one commentator who kept calling Alioski Samuel Saiz when he didn't even play for the club anymore. So, you know, it's a step in the right direction, isn't it? But anyway, um, that's that to begin us to the end of episode 119. Obviously... Two um, absentees today, Paddy and uh, old Ben, couldn't be asked. Uh, <laughs> um, Paddy's gone out for his birthday because it's his birthday tomorrow, so many after he turns to, to Pad. Uh, and old Ben's gone for the last supper before the national lockdown tomorrow. So, yeah, it brings us to an end of episode 119. Uh, a big thanks to Simon, who's just, I think, lost connection <laughs> right, on, right on cue. Uh, a big thanks to young Ben in the Harry Potter studio without no way at this time, though. Yeah, yeah, they've uh, they'll make come back next week, don't worry. Happy days. And uh, a big thanks to the man who, as it was mentioned in the comments, had the second best beard on talking to you tonight. As, uh, yeah, Sy 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 Sy's out, out beard, man. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if Sy can still hear us, but um, he currently looks like he's being snapped on CCTV stealing his sausage rolls. <laughs> oh, he's back. He's back. So, uh, oh, massive right. thanks. All the uh, had the power cut down here. I must not pay the bill. <laughs> <laughs> mate a massive thanks to you for giving us your time and uh fighting through that london traffic to to join us on the show uh big thanks mate and and good luck with everything we uh haven't and and the other club I will not mention uh as the season goes on uh a big thanks to everybody who's uh tuned in please like share subscribe all the usual bobbins uh, and before we go uh, we better hear from our, our very last sponsor the guys at the social maze if you rely, particularly now on lockdown, in your business being uh, seen and heard on social media, but you might not have the time, expertise or skills to manage your own social media, or you might just need some little tips, uh, check out the guys at The Social Mayors. Again, they've been with us right from the very start, and these guys are experts in uh, maximizing your brand's potential on social media because everybody uses social media nowadays. So go check them out at info at socialmares.co.uk and they can help to maximise your business potential online. And that does bring us to an end of episode 119. Uh, a massive thanks to everybody who's tuned in. Uh, see you again next week, same time, same place. Uh, and that'll be it. I'll see you there. See you there. Cheers, lads.